involved with RSM for nearly 15 years. Support from someone who's been there makes all the difference. Hey, David, what are you listening to? Kidney Talk, an online radio podcast that talks about kidney disease and the prevention of it. Oh, cool. Where can I find that? Oh, you can download it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh, nice. I'll definitely have to download that. Shout out to Renal Support Network, the annual Renal Support Network essay contest. I won the Renal Support Network contest last year, the Warrior. And we are all warriors. So thank you, thank you. Keep on doing all that you do. And um, be happy and healthy and keep the hope. Thank you, Renal Support Network. Woohoo! As a kidney transplant recipient, I find that having an actual publication like Kidney Talk is an invaluable resource for any kidney warrior at any stage. RSN keeps me informed of kidney advocacy issues so my voice can be heard. I'm really looking forward to the prom this year and meeting people who are just like me. Dressing up is super fun and all the activities are amazing. Can't wait to see you there! participating in the Renal Support Network 30-minute fitness Zoom classes. Not only have I lost 15 pounds, but I can also strike a yoga pose like this. When I created Renal Support Network back in 1993, I had no idea the impact that I would have among my peers. An illness is too demanding when you don't have hope, and peer support, education, and knowledge are crucial to our survival. We have a great week planned with some incredible speakers, uh, great uh, information for you to share, learn, so we can survive and thrive with this illness. It's imperative. So uh, stay tuned, we're gonna have a great event, and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen. speaker for today. This is our last speaker today. We have Ms. Susie Liu, MD. She's a professor of medicine at the George Washington University. Woohoo! I just went there for public health. Uh, School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She serves as the director of clinical services at the GW Medical F uh, Faculty Associates and the medical director for peritoneal dialysis at the Vita K Street. Her clinical interest includes peritoneal dialysis, where she cares for the largest number of peritoneal dialysis patients in the DC area. She also has interest in pregnancy-related kidney diseases and hypertension, as well as chronic kidney disease. Dr. Liu is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, American Society of Nephrology, and the National Kidney Foundation, and a member of the International Society of Nephrology. She's gonna to talk to us today about how to get the most out of your telehealth visit. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Hi, fellow GWU alumni. Um, and we can't wait to hear what you have to offer us today. Thank you very much, Wendy, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank Lori and her whole team uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. I don't have any disclosures. The objectives are to review regulatory changes in telehealth during the COVID pandemic under the public health emergency, two, to review the components of a monthly medical visit and how to optimize efficient use of the visit, and three, to review the future of telehealth and some of the challenges. So many of us use the term telehealth and telemedicine interchangeably, but they are actually quite different. Telemedicine refers to the practice of medicine using electronic communication, information technology, or other means where the physician is in one location and the patient is at another location. And it's this uh, meeting between the doctor and the patient. Whereas tele telehealth refers 
to the use of electronic information in any form uh, to be used um, for education or how your x-ray films get to the electronic health record or how your labs downloads all your information into the doctor's electronic health record. So it's a much broader term. So in telehealth, um, where the patient is located is called the originating site, and where the physician is located is called the remote site. So before the uh, pandemic, telehealth was only available for those living in rural areas. So they had to be in counties outside of a metropolitan statistical area. So the clinicians were usually in the office, and the patient had to be either in a hospital a federal funded clinic or the doctor's office, not in their home, not the way it is today, all right? And then it took an act of Congress to extend telehealth to home dialysis patients. So the home dialysis patients were allowed to elect telehealth. They got to choose whether they wanted to do telehealth or not. After a face-to-face -face visit three months in a row, to establish care with a clinician. And after that, they had to come in every third month. So it would be in-person visit, in-person visit, in-person visit to establish care. Then they could do telehealth, telehealth, come in person. Telehealth, telehealth, come in person. It had to be an audio, audio visual interaction, uh, just like we're doing now on, on Zoom. Uh, the home was the originating site. So this is the first time ever that a patient could be at home and there was no geographic restrictions. So a patient could be living in the city or they could be living uh, in an urban area or in a rural area. So this was really uh, a game changer. However, not many uh, home dialysis patients uh, took advantage of this because number one, they didn't know about it. The physicians didn't have the audiovisual uh, capacity uh, to perform this, and uh, they were really not ready for it. Then the public health emergency was declared uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and for the first time, uh, the home was, was the originating site for all patients. For the first time, patients getting dialysis, hemodialysis in an in-center, uh, could have their telehealth performed from the dialysis unit. Uh, and again, there was no geographic restriction. Many states waive state licensure as long as the provider held a license, an active license. So for example, I uh, have a DC license and I practice in the District of Columbia. But if my patient lived in Maryland or Virginia before this pandemic, I could not uh, see them from their home because I don't have those licenses. But with the pandemic, the governor of Maryland and Virginia said, it's okay uh, that you see patients that live in Maryland or Virginia as long as you have a, an active license. And that allowed many of the patients that I see now to be able to be seen because uh, of this waiver. Uh, physicians were able to bill for services across state line. Uh, and again, pay, new patients could be seen as well as established patients. So that, that rule that says you had to come in and be seen three times in order to establish care didn't apply anymore. Um, a platform such as Zoom or FaceTime or any of the um, apps that you can use can be used, it didn't have to be HIPAA compliant. Um, the public health emergency also allowed uh, phone calls to be reimbursed by, um, and, and care be provided. So uh, this was really important because not everybody has access to a phone with a camera and not everybody has access to the internet. So to be able to use the phone to get medical care is really important. And uh, payment was equal uh, for an in-person visit to a uh, telehealth visit. So now the new paradigm shows the patient at home or in the dialysis unit. And for the doctor, they could be 
uh, in the doctor's office, they could be in the dialysis unit, or they could even be at home. So for those uh, patients who receive dialysis, you know you get seen by an interdisciplinary uh, team. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so the originating site will have the patient at home, and for the first time now, family members can participate and caregivers can also participate because they don't have to start what they're doing at home or at work and accompany the patient uh, to the office. At the remote site, the nurse, clinician, dietitian, and social worker are available, and they could be seen either together as a group or they could be uh, seeing the patient separately. So when you're doing a, a telemedicine visit, use the time officially. Uh, we're so busy trying to get on, we look at ourselves to make sure we look okay, and then when the doctor says, how are you feeling, you just say, feel fine, you even forget what you want to say. So have all the issues and complaints listed on a piece of paper and have them available. So when the question is asked, how are you doing, do you have any complaints, you'll have them available. Have your vital signs completed and available, and if um, you're part of our home dialysis team, actually call the information in before the meeting so you don't use the time um, to give the vital signs or even check the vital signs. If you are a home dialysis patient, upload the treatment flow sheets or any data sheets that you have. And if you have access to the electronic health records to see what your labs look like, please do that beforehand because that way you'll know which ones, which items are it, the issue and then you can bring those up and, and discuss in further detail with the, uh, the team. So uh, in most practices, it's the nurse that will set up the appointment or the scheduler. They will help you download an app and instruct you on how to use the app. If, again, if you have any flow sheets that need to be uploaded, make sure that's done. Obtain the vital signs and record it uh, in the, the chart by the nurse, so it's already in the chart. If you have any nursing issues that need to be discussed, um, such as supplies or medications, uh, make sure those are discussed with the nurses um, beforehand so you don't take up the time when you're uh, spending it with the physician. And the nurses are good with ongoing education and training. So if you need additional education or training, just speak up and ask them and they can do it uh, using telehealth. So what is involved in a medical visit? So the clinician needs to document findings and we use something called a SOAP note. S-O-A-P standing for S for subjective, O for objective, A for assessment, and P for plan. So for subjective, the doctor or cl clinician will say, how are you feeling today? Do you have any complaints? If you still say, I feel fine, not much is gonna be discussed and things move on. But if you say, I, I feel fine now, but there are four things I like to discuss, this way the clinician has an idea of, uh, okay, I need to set aside time to discuss four topics. Uh, some may be long, some may be short, but at the end, the clinician remembers there were four things that need to be discussed and can circle back and say, okay, we've only discussed three of them. What was the fourth one? Just to close the visit. Objective includes vital signs. So vital signs are blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature. The physical exam, um, I will show you what a physical exam uh, is like in telehealth. Um, we like to assess the patient's volume status. Uh, and for those that are on dialysis, you know exactly what this means. Uh, it, it means the blood pressure reading and what the target weight is or dry weight. If you have a dialysis access, um, the clinician would like to look at that as well. And monthly labs are drawn in the dialysis unit. And if you are um, a patient in the clinic or the office, these labs are usually drawn either monthly or every two months or every three months. So um, we'll just call them labs. And then finally, after all this is uh, available, the clinician 
assesses how well you're doing uh, and then will give you a uh, an, um, feedback. Uh, and then if there are any changes that need to be done, that would be the plan or plan of action. So let's take a deeper dive into, into this medical exam. So I mentioned blood pressure. Uh, if you don't already have a blood pressure cuff, it's, uh, you should probably invest in one because the blood pressure uh, is really a key player in how you do. Because high blood pressure can cause kidney disease and people with kidney disease tend to have high blood pressure. Um, so um, you'll always be asked, what is your blood pressure? And if you can give a reading, that would be great. Uh, key things about taking a blood pressure, check the blood pressure and pulse in the sitting position. And uh, you should also check it in the standing position. And some of the tips about how to do this is to keep the arm at the level of the heart. If you raise the arm above the level of the heart, the blood pressure is going to be lower. If you put the arm down, it's going to be higher. Uh, when you take a blood pressure in the standing position, Stand up and wait two minutes before you check the blood pressure. You don't want to check your blood pressure sitting and then stand up right away and then check your blood pressure. And the reason why we check the blood pressure standing is some people drop, some people's blood pressure drop when they stand up. And that's why people uh, feel lightheaded and dizzy uh, and certain medical conditions uh, set people up to have low blood pressure when they, a lower blood pressure when they stand up. So if you just check your blood pressure in the sitting position and the doctor decides changing your medicine based on the sitting and doesn't realize that your blood pressure change when you stand up, then when a new medication is added or a higher dose is used, when you stand up, the blood pressure may really drop very low down to like 90 over 60. And we're concerned that um, that low blood pressure can cause the individual to faint or feel lightheaded and pass out. All right. So always give the doctor two blood pressure readings, a sitting and a standing. The ideal blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. But we say the range for the systolic is between 110 to 130. We don't like to see blood pressures over 140 because that denotes high, high blood pressure. Uh, and the clinician should really titrate the blood pressure uh, medications based on the lower blood pressure reading. Uh, and that could be usually the, the standing one. Weight is used to assess the volume status. Another piece of equipment, if you don't have at home, is a scale. Uh, and it's also something worth investing in. If you're a home dialysis patient, the um, dialysis unit would have given you a blood pressure cuff and a scale. These are two really important pieces of equipment to help the clinicians and, and the whole interdisciplinary team uh, really get a feel of how well you're doing. Uh, the target weight is the weight in which your legs don't have any leg swelling, and if any more fluid was taken from you, your blood pressure would drop. So that's really what the target weight is. Uh, a key for weighing yourself at home is try to weigh yourself under the same conditions. So um, for example, you don't want to weigh yourself after a meal, it's gonna be, the weight's gonna be heavier. Uh, and also, um, weigh yourself at the same time of the day because uh, you do different activities and your weight may change. And weigh yourself in, with the same amount of, of clothes on because if you wake up and you're just wearing pajamas, then you're not adding a whole, whole lot of uh, extra weight. But if you have um, a shirt on and corduroy pants and you have your shoes on and uh, you know, you have your keys in the pocket and, and your wallet in, in your pocket. Those are all going to add extra weight. Uh, and that is not good because the clinician will think that this is your weight, not this extra stuff. And they'll say, well, you need to lose more weight. You need to lose more weight. And, and that may not be a good thing. And now to the no touch physical exam. So the one thing about telehealth or telemedicine 
is that the clinician cannot do a physical exam. So everything is based on observations only. There's no hands-on. There's no stethoscope to listen to the heart or listen to the lungs or listen to the belly. Uh, and so there are, there are some findings that the clinician needs to see. And so it's important that you dress appropriately. Um, don't get all bundled up because they, they really want uh, to see your dialysis access, for example, or your PD exit site. Um, they they want to know if you press on your stomach, does it hurt? Uh, if you look at your legs, like press on the shin bone, does it have any swelling? And I've seen people go and sort of squeeze their legs. That's not what we want. So if your wrist is, if my wrist is the uh, ankle and the elbow is the knee, so we say take one finger and press on the shin bone near the um, ankle and hold it there for about 30 seconds and then release it. And if there's an indentation, like an orange that's gone bad and you push in and there's an indentation, that means you have leg swelling. That's called edema, all right? Uh, so if you have um, a vascular access for hemodialysis, this is what a normal access looks like. Here's another normal access, and you may see some needle track marks. And the, this is what a normal graft looks like. Uh, this is a, a fistula with an aneurysm. So you should point this out to your physician if you have one of these, because it just means that the wall is weakened and the, because there's so much pressure in the fistula, this thing could pop. So it needs to be addressed. This is a fistula that is infected. You can see the area is swollen and there's pus coming out. So this is not good. And the area looks red as well, some redness. So here's a PD exit site. This is a normal PD exit site. Uh, there's no redness, there's no drainage. And here, here, here's one that is an infection. So it's a little bit red around it. There's some redness that extends beyond the exit site, and there's some drainage coming out here. This is a, we call it a proud flesh or hypergranulation. This is just extra tissue that has grown. Uh, and what we like is, is to remove this and um, your nurse can actually take care of this uh, with the silver nitrate stick. So next we move on to laboratory results. This is also part of the objective finding. Uh, and so we're interested in the dialysis, uh, dialysis adequacy. And for patients with chronic kidney disease, we're interested in kidney function. We're interested in the nutrition and electrolytes. Uh, the other area is mineral bone disease and finally anemia. So we will go through these quickly. So for dialysis adequacy, you know this is called KT over V or kinetics. For hemodialysis, it's a blood test taken at the beginning of the treatment and another one at the end. And the calculation is to determine how much uh, waste product is removed during the treatment. And the ideal number is greater than 1.2 per treatment. For patients on peritoneal dialysis, uh, you bring in all the fluid plus 24-hour uh, um, worth of urine, and uh, we um, the KT over V is calculated, and the ideal number is 1.7 or greater per week. All right, so these should be familiar terms. If a person is not on dialysis yet, it's uh, and they have chronic kidney disease, the numbers that the doctors look at are BUN or serum creatinine. And even better, it's the EGFR, which stands for the Estimated Glomerular Filtration Rate. Uh, and this is a, a percentage, we call it. So uh, uh, perfect kidneys would have an EGFR of 100%. Anything above 60 is considered okay. And as the numbers go lower and lower, then there's worse um, kidney function. And usually a patient with an EGFR of less than 15 require dialysis. And it's the trends that the doctors look at um, more than the absolute number. Um, so we've just heard a excellent presentation on several of them actually on nutrition. Uh, here is protein. 
uh, how much protein should someone take? And for individuals with chronic kidney disease, the recommended amount of protein is 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day. And for patients with on hemodialysis, it's approximately one gram per kilogram body weight per day. And for individuals on peritoneal dialysis, it's 1.2 to 1.3 grams per kilogram body weight per day. So why is there the difference? So in patients with chronic kidney disease, the more protein one eats, the harder the kidney has to work. And therefore there would be progression of renal failure. Uh, and so that's why there's a tendency to have the patient eat a lower protein diet. In both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, the patient loses protein and nutrition while they're on the treatment. So hemodialysis, the patient's only on there for about three to four hours, uh, whereas in peritoneal dialysis, the patient gets dialysis continuously uh, throughout the day and throughout the night. And so they actually lose a whole lot more protein, and that's why patients who are for peritoneal dialysis gets to eat a higher protein diet. Uh, and the biomarker that we use to denote whether someone is getting adequate nutrition is the albumin level. And we like to see that value to be greater than four. Uh, and here are animal-based and uh, plant-based or plant-dominant uh, protein, as we just heard. Uh, the other that lab value that uh, the dietitian spends a lot of time on, and as well as the clinician, is the potassium. And the target potassium range is between 3.5 and 5. Uh, and there are complications of having a low potassium or a high potassium. And, and I list them here. And the ones that are most worrisome are the ones that affect the heart rhythm. And we say if the potassium is too high or too low, it can cause irregular heartbeat, it can cause the heart to stop beating, it can cause chest pain. And there are other organs that are involved as well as the, as the lung can, uh, because of the diaphragm, that's the muscle that moves um, respiration. And so the patient can have shortness of breath. And, and GI wise, because the uh, intestines are not moving very well, can cause nausea and vomiting. Uh, and then if the potassium level is very low, the muscles may cramp. And um, people on hemodialysis know this because as the potassium level drops, they start having cramps. And if the potassium level is too high, um, they have weakness. And many people come to the emergency room after missing several dialysis treatments. They say, I feel very weak, I don't feel well. And that's because the potassium level is very high. And here are some foods that have very high potassium levels in it. And you should probably avoid them, but if you want to eat them, make sure you eat in moderation. Uh, and there are nutrition counters that can tell you how much potassium is in a certain food and what portion size. So if you follow that, it is very possible for you to eat these foods. The next area, uh, of interest is the mineral bone disease, and it involves four lab values. That's the vitamin D level, the parathyroid hormone, calcium level, and the phosphorus. Uh, and the three organs that are involved, one is the bone, two is the kidney, and three is the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid glands consist of four glands that sit behind the thyroid gland, and they all interact with each other. You cannot separate them. So the uh, role of the kidney is that um, the kidney makes vitamin D. So when individuals have kidney disease, there is less vitamin D available. And that's why we check vitamin D levels and give back vitamin D to the patient. Um, the, so there's nutritional and there's the active forms of vitamin D and the vitamin D um, that are active are usually given um, to patients who are on dialysis. If the, um, so vitamin D is also important in, in controlling the parathyroid uh, hormone level. And, and that's another reason to make sure that the vitamin D level is in the range that it should be in. The phosphorus level is high in patients whose kidneys are not working because it's the kidney's job to get rid of phosphorus. 
And so the phosphorus level is high. So how do we correct it? We ask uh, individuals to eat a low phosphate diet. And that's usually reducing um, things like uh, meats, beans, nuts. Uh, and that's not always easy to do. And so we provide phosphate binders uh, to patients and they take this with their meal so that the binder binds the phosphorus that's uh, in the food and it comes out in the stool and not absorbed by the um, GI tract. The parathyroid hormone is elevated in uh, individuals who have end-stage renal disease and we control the parathyroid hormone level uh, using vitamin D, optimizing the phosphorus level, and optimizing the calcium level. Uh, we can also use calcium mimetic, which there are two now, an oral and an IV, to control the parathyroid level. The calcium level is something that is also, um, that needs to be within the range. And we don't like to see a calcium level above um, 10.2. And so that, that value is closely monitored. And the last section in the, in the labs that we pay a lot of attention to is anemia. So the definition of anemia is a hemoglobin less than 12 in women and less than 13.5 in men. Uh, and individuals with kidney disease have anemia, could be from any uh, reason that anybody else can have, but they have something very special in that erythropoietin, that's the hormone that makes, uh, helps stimulate, make red blood cells, is made in the kidney. So if the kidney is not functioning well and doesn't have the, the cells to make this erythropoietin, the erythropoietin level is low. So patients with anemia have symptoms. And um, I mean, we have all, many of us have these symptoms, but this is, these symptoms are most noticeable in patients who are on dialysis uh, that have anemia. So uh, in the evaluation of anemia, uh, there's really three big main categories. Either the body is not making the red blood cells, or the body is destroying the red blood cells, or the body is losing the red blood cells. So um, an example of the body not making red blood cells is if there's a bone marrow disorder or somebody lacks the nutrition like B12 and folic acid to uh, stimulate the red blood cell production, or they lack the stimulator, the erythropoiesis stimulating agents. So if the body is destroying the red blood cells, that's called hemolysis. But this also occurs when patients are in hemodialysis because as the blood is traveling through the tubing and the dialyzer, some of those very delicate cells um, get smashed. And that's what a hemolysis means, the red blood cells getting smashed. And then finally, is the body losing the red blood cells? And so patients who are on hemodialysis lose a lot more blood than patients on peritoneal dialysis because as they know, when they go to the dialysis unit, they're always drawing blood. And if they have a catheter, they always pull off some uh, blood and discard it to make sure that the catheter is working before they're attached to the hemodialysis machine. If the filter clots, there's a lot of blood that's lost in that. And then when the treatment is completed, the blood has to be rinsed back to the patient and not all the blood is rinsed back. And that's why the uh, filter looks a little pink in color. Uh, and then finally, when they hold the access to stop the bleeding, sometimes there's additional bleeding from that site. Another cause for anemia is GI bleed. And uh, this is not uncommon in uh, patients on dialysis. And so please note that if the stool is black or you actually see blood, that you actually bring that to your doctor's attention. So the treatment for anemia, for those who have uh, chronic kidney disease in stage four or five, or those on dialysis, you know, it's one of the ESAs, uh, and there are four that are currently available, and any one of these are uh, given, and they will work. Uh, if the individual is iron deficient, the iron can be given as a pill or uh, intravenously, and if they have vitamin deficiencies such as B12 or folic acid, uh, that's also returned. So a lot of this is part of the objective finding that the clinicians look at on, on a monthly basis and decide what needs to be done. 
Part of the interdisciplinary team is the dietitian, uh, and they are very helpful in reviewing labs and they provide dietary counseling. And um, we value our dietitians immensely. They provide education, they provide samples, and they uh, supply coupons to, uh, to our patients. Uh, the social worker is another invaluable uh, individual. They provide so psychosocial support. Uh, they help out with insurance issues. They help with transportation issue, issues, uh, and they also help people uh, who have financial or work insecurity. Uh, and we've heard also food insecurity and housing insecurity, especially during this pandemic, and um, the social workers have really been working over time. Uh, okay, and finally, after all this information is compiled, the physician or clinician makes an assessment and the team can assess the patient uh, by giving them a report card so they have something to take home. Uh, and hopefully the uh, physician will address any of the issues that the patient uh, brought up during the visit as well. Uh, I do a lot of talking during the visit. Uh, and sometimes the patient says at the end, what do we decide to do? Uh, and I actually give them a, a printed sheet of paper with all the list of all their medications, their prescription, as well as when their next appointment is up and when they need to come back to get blood drawn or when they need to come back to the clinic uh, for their EPO shots or whatever. Uh, and, th and that really helps organize their thought and action. So the plan is what to do. And this could be a change in the prescription, uh, in which case supplies need to be uh, ordered. If there's a change in medication, then the prescription needs to be sent to the pharmacy. If there are additional diagnostic tests that need to be done, then those orders need to be put in to radiology or to the lab. And if there are any referrals to a subspecialist, uh, they, those referrals may need to be put in. And any uh, changes in dietary um, will come from the dietitian, And if there are any forms that need to be filled out, the social worker can help out. Uh, and these are forms for service. So in this monthly visit, the sessions are a half hour to an hour. So a lot of ground needs to be covered. And so therefore, make it easier on yourself and make it easy on the team. Again, have the list of, of uh, issues that you want to discuss with the clinician and complain so that they are there. Help the physician with the physical exam. Um, you know, don't put on lots of clothes that mask the um, site that needs to be looked at. Have them um, avail, have the access available so the clinician can see it, all right? And then if you look at labs beforehand, you can bring up the ones that need to be discussed. If not, the clinician will bring it up. So don't forget the patient is center stage, uh, make efficient use of the time. Uh, caretakers, uh, caregivers and uh, family members are welcome. But if you don't want them in the room, you can ask them to leave. Uh, usually the clinician should ask the uh, patient whether it's okay for family members uh, to sit in on the visit or not. Uh, and this is especially important for adolescents because they need some privacy to talk about certain things. Uh, and at the same time, they don't want to disappoint, disappoint their parent. So uh, give those uh, young adults and uh, adolescents a, a private moment with the clinician. So that's the end of the, the physical uh, medical evaluation. Uh, I just want to bring up a few slides uh, that have other uh, issues that could be discussed. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're interested in a kidney transplant, bring that issue up. Health maintenance uh, issues such as is it time for um, the mammogram, pap smear, or um, colonoscopy, uh, vaccines, uh, are you on schedule? If you have a dental appointment, do you need a prophylactic antibiotic? Uh, if the individual have, has hepatitis C, uh, is the patient a candidate for treatment? And is it time for the next colonoscopy? 
Uh, other areas about home dialysis patients to discuss is what happens if there's no electricity? What happens if there's no water? Or if you're a PD patient, how do you warm up PD fluid if there's no electricity? Uh, what happens if there's a natural disaster? How do you do dialysis at home? How do you do dialysis in the center? Uh, how much supplies do you need to keep in the, in, in the home during the winter months? And is there a way I can get my medications delivered to the house? So all these questions could be brought up uh, and discussed with the team. Uh, some of the telehealth challenges are that not everyone has access to the internet or a device. Um, if you're so th that still needs to be addressed if there are concerns for privacy. Uh, use a headset. So if you're in the dialysis unit and they're making rounds, you put the headset on so the people around you only hear your end of the conversation, not the doctor talking as well. Um, clinicians are unable to do the physical exam in the traditional way, so help them out as much as possible. Uh, and if the issue is not resolved, you may have to come and uh, do an in-person visit. Um, so the questions that come up is what will happen after the pandemic? Will we go back to uh, pre-levels or will there be some features of this public health emergency that will be ad uh, adopted? Uh, and we hope that telehealth will play roles in education, uh, especially CKD education, training as far as like home PD or home um, hemodialysis. There's a lot of remote monitoring that can take place. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a machine uh, that took your blood pressure uh, and it would be uh, transmitted to a modem in your house and then that uh, information would be transmitted to the dialysis unit and you wouldn't even have to uh, take a pen or paper <laughs> and write it down. Uh, and then uh, I've seen some devices where the uh, blood pressure machine will actually say the blood pressure and say, your blood pressure reading is 120 over 80. Uh, and the other nice thing that we could probably uh, find is that at some point uh, they will say, your blood pressure is 90 over 60, that is low for you, or your blood pressure is 150 over 90, that is high. Um, so hopefully there'll be uh, changes in technology that will uh, improve uh, care. So what are some of the future technological changes? Um, so the platform that we use could always use some refinement. Uh, we wanna make sure everybody has access to the internet. And wouldn't it be nice if we have a phone that we can place next to our heart or lung, and then the heart sounds and the lung sounds could be picked up. So no more stethoscope, just the iPhone for everything. Uh, how can we increase the use of remote monitoring? So that means less information that you, the patient has to record and everything can be transmitted over. And what about the role of artificial intelligence uh, in playing that, artificial intelligence can play in data management uh, because there's a lot of information coming in um, currently. Uh, so I thank you for your attention and don't forget you the patient um, is the center of the stage. We want to hear from you. If there's something that we're doing correct with telemedicine, let us know. If there's something we're not doing correctly, let us know as well because this is all in evolution. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for that information. I hope everybody found it very helpful um, with the diversity of presenters here, and we find that so fascinating. And I love the idea um, of some of the new technologies. I definitely second that. So thank you for that information. So remember, we will be doing an interactive game in a few minutes, so don't forget to stay on and test your luck to see if you can win. I do have a question here in the chat box for you, Dr. Liu, and that is, is there a difference in taking Tums versus pure calcium carbonate? And then also, it's curi there's a curiosity about when to exactly take um, the phosphorus binder. Should it be five minutes before eating, right at the time of eating, after eating? And this is asked by Paula Siegel. Okay, thank you for the question. So um, Tums is calcium carbonate, uh, so it is the same. Uh, and it's definitely much cheaper than getting calcium carbonate. Um, there is 
a movement uh, from using calcium-based phosphate binders. It's probably better not to use them because there's so much calcium that it can lead to high calcium levels and it can cause hardening of the artery and, and um, blood vessel stiffening. Uh, so it's not the preferred. As far as phosphate binders are concerned, I, I'm not sure if there's a correct answer whether you should take it before eating a meal, you take it with the meal or take it after the meal. Uh, so I think the reason why there's no correct answer is depends how you eat. So you know there are some people that can eat a meal in five minutes. So in, if you eat everything <laughs> in five minutes, it really doesn't matter when you take it because the okay. binder is going to be in the stomach and GI tract at the same time because it's only five minutes. But if it takes you 45 minutes to eat a meal because you start with a, a soup and then there's a salad and then you chit chat and then you eat the meal and then there's the dessert, you know that if you take the, uh, the phosphate binder at the beginning of the meal, it's not going to be in the stomach 45 minutes later because a lot of the the binder has moved forward in, in the GI tract. And so mm -hmm. if you take a meal over a 45 minute period, it may be good to take a pill at the beginning, a pill in the middle and, and a, a pill at the end. Similarly, if you decide to take the pill at the end of the meal and, and it takes you 45 minutes to eat, some of the food has already passed the stomach and it's already in the intestine. Um, so we have patients actually experiment. We say, try it at the beginning of the meal. Try it through taking it in the middle of the meal and take it at the end of the meal and see which one gives you the best result because the, what you're trying to do is to lower your phosphorus level. There was one more that I saw in the Q&A and this is um, from Kathy. I don't know how to, uh, she says Kathy New Organ, that's her handle. Um, if one has a belly button hernia, does that serve as a barrier to any type of dialysis? And she says, thank you kindly for it. Okay, yeah. so if there's a belly button hernia, um, what, you, what you're asking basically is, will you be a candidate for peritoneal dialysis? Uh, and because once the peritoneal fluid is in the belly, some of that fluid can get into the hernia and then the hernia gets a little bit larger and it, it could be quite painful too. So therefore, if you have a belly button hernia and you know about it, get it fixed at the time that the PD catheter goes in uh, so that it, it won't be a problem later on. And if it shows up later on because it wasn't detected at the time of uh, PD catheter placement, then it could be fixed later on. And the, the earlier it gets fixed, the better, uh, because at that time, you, the individual still has residual kidney function, meaning you're still making urine and, and you're not totally dialysis dependent. And so if you uh, get the hernia fixed, you could go on a, um, a lower dose of dialysis, meaning you could do the peritoneal dialysis in the supine position with you know, one liter instead of two liters. And that way you can get through that healing period of about a month uh, without having to go on hemodialysis. If you wait okay. late and there's no urine coming out and you, know, you need the, the full dose of peritoneal dialysis, it, it gets much harder. Um, oh, I see. Okay, um, we have one more. Um, this is from Cher. When taking your blood pressure when standing, I know it usually goes down. Is there any significant if it goes up upon standing? No, usually we, it, it can go up because you are, what happens is when you stand up, all the blood rushes to the lower extremities, uh, but the muscles and the blood vessels in your uh, lower extremity squeeze to send the blood back up. And that's why if you have good muscles and um, good vessels, that push of blood can send the blood pressure up uh, in the upper extremity. Yeah, and for some people, it takes them an effort to get up and, and stand up. And so sometimes we see the higher blood pressure because the effort it takes to um, get up. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that one. 
Well, thank you, everyone. Um, this concludes our presentations for the beginning of Hope Week, hosted by RSN and the amazing Lori Hartwell and her team. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.